He's passionate about learning and education and is a self-learner. He self-learned programming and learned to play the drums in a jazz band and wanted it to become his profession. He began his career as a lecturer for cultural studies at Humboldt University, and there he learned the importance of continuous learning. In 2008, with his co-founders, he founded Babbel, the world's first language learning app with the vision, anyone can learn languages. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Marcus Witt. Good morning. I'm uh, Markus Witte, CEO at Babel, and uh, today I'd like to talk about disruption and about Babel. Let me start with Babel. It's the app to get people to learn new languages. Um, whether you want to just order pizza in Italian or speak Swedish to your uh, Swedish in-laws, Babel is the app for you, or for anybody else wanting to pick up a new language. We teach a total of 14 languages from seven languages, which makes a total of 91 language pairs. Do the math. And the whole thing is based on a subscription model, which helps us to cater our products straight to our customers without advertising or indirect monetization, which is uh, helpful to create something. When we started Babel 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago, we funded the company out of our own pockets for um, 18 months uh, until we got to 80,000 users because we wanted to focus on those users and build something that matters. But over the time, we raised a total of uh, 33 million US dollars to manage the steep growth we were in. And uh, becoming break even in 2011 didn't keep us from doing so. The market that we're in is estimated to be around $60 billion in volume. But probably you know as good as I that these are just ball game figures and that the real question is, how many people in the world actually want to learn a new language? That is the question that for us drives growth and potential. So are we disruptive? Should we be disruptive? What does it mean to be disruptive? Everybody seems to be talking about it. Well, the notion of disruption is very fuzzy these days. And I won't bore you with going back to where it actually came from and how it developed. One thing, though, we should keep all in mind, disruption is about industries. It's about markets. That is what the term focuses on. And there's a lot of talk about it. We looked it up on Business Wire, and uh, we found 2,000, more than 2,000, press releases in over the last year of companies that claim to be disruptive. That is more than eight per business day. That is a lot of disruption going on out there. It's almost scary. But what is the actual problem? And the interesting thing, going back to the notion of disruption, is that markets and industries usually don't have problems or needs or urges. People have. It's people who want things, who want to learn a language, for instance. And language learning is a real problem. I learned that yesterday again, not for the first time, as you can imagine, um, in this beautiful city when I tried to get around with just German and English and a couple of Roman languages. That didn't help me a lot. Uh, so, languages are important. But language learning has been solved, right? Hundreds and hundreds of years, people have been learning languages. So, what's the problem? The problem is that the solution to the language learning product uh, problem is as good as concert, live concerts are a solution to my need of listening to music. They work. I love music concerts. But when I cycle to work, when I'm at home, when I'm at my desk, 
they don't work. There's a barrier. There's something that keeps me from it. And that's the problem. And digital technologies always have been very, very good to make these boundaries disappear, to make things easier and more accessible. That's true for music, and that is especially true for games. Don't know whether you still remember those days when the world was separated into gamers and non-gamers. And being a gamer meant going into a store, buying a package, taking it home, installing it on a computer, and playing a game. And then someday, you got an invite to Farmville from your mother. What happened there? Something, some boundary disappeared. And that is what I'm talking about. It's a reinvention of something. Games have been reinvented into a new space. And that is what we're trying to do with language learning because the old methodologies are good. They work. Teachers, schools, great things. But as, con as musical concerts, you can't have it all the time. It's not easy. It's not something you can fit into your day. And <clears throat> to do that, for us, proved to be harder than we actually thought. That's probably true for any tech company and maybe for any company at all, that you start and you think it's going to be hard, but then it's actually a lot harder than you thought, way harder than you thought. And the problem is that there's no solution yet. When we started, there was no way to learn a language on the internet. And we thought we just bring what's there, all the great content, onto the web. That's actually what publishing houses also, also thought and what they sometimes still think. Back then, what they thought was, we'll do a PDF online because we have all that great content. And guess what? Doesn't work. What works is to get engineers and designers and teachers and a lot of other people into a room and have them fight. And they don't speak the same language. Even if all of them speak English, it takes a long time for them to create something that makes sense. It is very, very hard to do that. And there's only one North Star that helps doing that, and that is the user. For us, that was the easy part because none of the Babel founders was a language teacher or had a specific idea how language teaching works. We thought has been solved, shouldn't be too hard. And we started from the user's perspective. We actually wanted to learn a language. One of us wanted to learn a language on the internet and found out there is no language learning on the internet. So we changed from music software into language learning. And we always kept the user in mind when we build stuff and never, never the idea of disrupting a market or disrupting an industry or bringing something online. And that brought us to a point where we ask 40,000 of our learners how their experience is and how they think success works with the app. And over 70% of them said that in less than five hours they were able to have a first conversation in a new language. That is worth working for. That is something to, that I think is, is great success. And it's not about markets. And it's not about disruption for us. And it's not a game. So games are an inspiring example to make boundaries go away. But one thing that games have is they are self-referential. And as much as the fantasy of learning just being a game is a great thing, you actually want to learn something to do something, to have a conversation in real life. And for that, you need an outside reference. That's why we need to talk to our users and can't just optimize on the data set that we get out of the app. But, uh, because otherwise, we would just get them better at using Babel and not at speaking languages. So what does this all mean? 
For me, it means that all this talk about industries and disruption addresses the wrong problem. Oh, and all the people I talk to, all the tech people, are usually there to solve a problem and not to disrupt a market. So why are we all talking about disruption? It doesn't matter. If disruption comes along, okay, fine. If we end up changing a market, that's fine. For us, what I'm proud of is we didn't disrupt a market. No student less did go to a language co uh, course because of us. We push more people into schools and more people into private tutoring because we get people started to learn a language who wouldn't have started doing that before. And I think that's worth doing, not taking other people's jobs and trying to get their money on your bank account. And success still can happen. For us, it's the success of our learners and also the milestone of one million paying subscribers that we crossed last year. That, for me, shows that focusing on a user actually can make a difference also for a business, and you can actually get to a meaningful size with that mission and not with the mission of disrupting an industry. Thank you.